We are now here at the Delta office where the students like to chillax and play Mario Kart and like drink, uh, drink uh, adult soda when uh, between the lectures. And with me today I got a very special guest. He puts, uh, for physics students, he puts the young Nye Friedman, Nye Friedman, sorry, in Young and Friedman. Uh, very welcome to Roger Friedman. Hi everybody. And uh, you, I have to say, you kind of look like a cartoon uh, uh, character. Well, yeah, I, well they, I actually have been a cartoon character. You have been a cartoon character. I have. Um, yeah. I have, uh, through various connections, I've actually appeared in both DC Comics and Marvel Comics as a villain. In, so I've been a villain in DC. I was part of a musical group of aliens that was fighting Superman back in the 1970s. And more recently, in the early 1980s, a friend of mine who's a cartoonist, he did a variation of the origin of Spider-Man, except there, instead of a... Um, human being bitten by a radioactive spider, the story was it was a teenage spider who was bitten by a radioactive human. And I was the human that bit him, and so the spider changed into the amazing man spider, and everything went from there. But, yeah, so I, so I actually do have some comic background, and I used to work in the comic book industry a number of years ago, so, so thank you. And I, this is the best I can do with trying to do Tony Stark as Iron Man. You know. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Uh, but, but I have to ask, you, you have written this uh, book, University of Physics, that like all first year students has to read about. And like, uh, I just wonder, what makes you go write a book? Do you like one day knit your shoe and you just, just think, let's write a book? Yeah. Well, the, the history on the book, actually the first edition of University of Physics dates from 1948. You know, I wasn't born yet, so I'm yeah. not responsible. Uh, but the original authors, Professor Sears and Zemansky, they did four editions of the book, and then in the early 1970s, they turned it over to Hugh Young, who was then at Carnegie Mellon University in the United States, and he did editions five, six, seven, and eight, and then he said, enough, <laughs> uh, and then he turned it over to me, and so it's sort of been passed down from generation to another, so I've been working on the book for the last uh, more than 20 years now, oh. and so, so now I've done through the 14th edition, and the new 14th edition, I should mention, actually has a uh, Norwegian bridge on the cover. So it, it definitely oh, has Norwegian content. Cool. Yes, it has the, the, the Leonardo bridge is actually yeah. done, it, done in Oz, but yeah. And, um, but in terms of what I try to do in teaching these, or writing the book, the main thing I find that happens in an introductory physics class is, even if you've never had any physics before, you come in the class, Everyone who comes in is an expert in physics. Because even if you've never taken physics before, you may have had 18 years of running and jumping and turning switches on and off, catching balls, skiing, things like that. And so you've actually put together in your head a common sense description of the physical universe. And the problem is it's completely wrong. And so the great challenge with physics is actually convincing students that what they already know needs to be changed. That's, for instance, one thing you'll find in every chapter of the book are these caution paragraphs yeah. that alert you to common misconceptions. But in a large sense, that's why physics is so hard. It's because you already know yeah, everything about it, you just know it wrong. And so, so I enjoy trying to work my way around that challenge and make it accessible to students. Yeah, I can really relate to that. Uh, uh, but you... Uh, you told me uh, before this interview that you have this uh, sort of different kind of uh, lectures for your students. Right. Could you like tell me? Uh, sure. Yeah. But, you know, the standard technique that most people use is you come into the classroom, you hear a lecture from the professor, and they're great lectures because the professors learn so much from writing them. Yeah. And say, oh, this is great. The students are totally going to understand this. You sit through the lecture. You say, oh, that was a great lecture. I totally understand that. You go home to try to solve problems and say, I totally didn't understand that no, at all. No, no. <laughs> and the reason fundamentally why we give lectures is because our professors gave us lectures and their professors gave us lectures. And it goes back to the Middle Ages before there were printing presses where literally a lecture was when there was one copy of the book, the professor had it, and he would read it to all the students in class who would copy it down. And that is a very low data rate means of information transfer. Uh, but that's what they had to do. Well, 
we have printing presses now. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to do that. So instead, let's say, well, let's flip that idea around. Instead of everyone getting together for a lecture and then going off on their own to try to solve problems, let's reverse that, do what's called the flipped class model. And there what I do is I still have lectures, but they're video podcasts, just like the one you're watching right now. And so the students see my lectures as video podcasts. They see that before they come to class, I actually give them an online assignment where they have, have to answer some questions about the video. And actually they have to pose a question for me about something in the video they didn't understand. Then I look through those, decide what they're confused about, and then when we come to class the next day, I answer some of those questions, and then most of the time, the students are actually solving problems, answering conceptual questions, and so they're busy the whole time they're in class. Yeah. And so they get instant feedback as to what they understand and what they don't understand, and more, probably most importantly, none of them fall asleep. Because there's no time to fall asleep because they're all doing things. <laughs> yeah, that's one big issue. Yes. That sounds like a really interesting way of doing it. And I have to say, I've never heard of it. Yeah. No, and I'm actually, I've been speaking to some of your faculty here at NTNU and showing them, you know, why this works and why it can be adapted to uh, the classrooms here. And so you might want to look for some interesting changes happening here in the physics courses over the next couple of years. Really cool. Uh, later today, uh, you're holding this uh, lecture about uh, flight. Is yes. that right? Uh, could you like say what you're gonna talk about? Later sure. Later? So today's lecture is on the physics of flight. I'm I'm interested in it just because I've always been interested in airplanes, and actually for the last 30 years I've been a pilot, and so I've flown flown. We have a small plane. We fly flown all over North America, all over the United States, up into Canada. And, and done a little, actually this last summer I got to do some flying in southern Africa, which was really fun. Um, and it turns out there's lots of really interesting physics associated with that, and lots of misconceptions. You ask the average person how an airplane flies, and they're very confused about what the air does as it flows around the wing. So that's one thing I'll be talking about. And it turns out there's also a, lots of analogies between the way that airplanes are designed and the way that birds are set up. It, it's not an, they're not identical, but there's lots of similarities. There's even some very detailed structures that we'll find on wings that are directly analogous to some of the interesting structures you find on the wings of airliners. So I'll be talking about some of that today as well. Yeah, cool. But, but, but what do you think of the Trondheim Science Week? So oh, it, it, everything looks great. I've been very impressed with all the students who I've met. Uh, the faculty seem really interested and excited. Um, I'm particularly impressed with how well organized Delta is as a student organization. Um, I'm, when I go back to California, to my home university, University of California, Santa Barbara, I'm actually going to tell the students, okay, you need to get on the stick because the Norwegians know how to do it right. <laughs> and, and, so here, and so I'm going to have to invite some of you guys over to actually do some tutoring for our students <laughs> as to how to set up a student organization. And, and you're welcome to come to Santa Barbara, actually. We have a long-standing tradition of students from NTNU coming to UC Santa Barbara to study for a year. I actually know several students who've done that. Um, and there's all kinds of great opportunities. You know, the skiing is not as good, but the surfing is much better. <laughs> so if you teach us how to teach, we can teach you how to be students. That, that sounds great. That, yeah. That sounds like a good trade-off. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Do you have a favorite theorem? A favorite theorem? Well, that's an excellent question. One that I really like more than any other theorem. Uh, this sounds a little wishy-washy, but I've never met a theorem I didn't like. <laughs> um, but I actually, I think I'd have to say, well, certainly my favorite theorist I can think of to the, is still Carl Friedrich Gauss. Because. Hmm. Uh, for instance, Gauss's law for electromagnetism, yeah. it's like, where did that come from? And Gauss was such an amazing person and so incredibly smart. The two stories about Gauss I like best is when he was a small child, he had a personal tutor because his parents knew he was incredibly smart. And, and of course, he was a little kid, so he was, he was misbehaving, so the tutor said, Gauss, go sit over in the corner and add up the numbers from 1 to 100 thinking that would keep him busy for a while. So Gauss sat there for a few seconds and said, oh, 5,050. I said, well, how did you do that? He said, well, I thought, well, I could do one, two, three, but 
like 1 and 100 is 101, 2 and 99 is 101, 3 and 98 is 101, and there's 50 such pairs, so it's 50 times 101, or it's 5,050. And he actually thought through that faster than I was able to explain it to you. The other thing about Gauss that amazes me, in 1800, um, an astronomer was the first person to discover one of the asteroids that orbits between Mars and Jupiter. And, but then it went behind the sun, and so he lost it. He said, okay, well, where's it going to come out on the other side? Gauss, can you help? So Gauss did all these calculations. He developed a method where, based on three observations of the position of an asteroid in the sky, you can calculate its future trajectory. And so he had to do all, all these long calculations. Well, to save time, there were all these multiplications he had to do. So what he would do is, he, in his head, he would think, okay, these two numbers, he would look up the logarithm in the log tables that he had memorized, add the logarithms together, and then look up the anti-logarithm for what the product was. And, okay. So that, that's why I bow to Gauss and all his theorems and all his theorizing. Thank you very much for coming here, Roger Friedman. All right, thanks very much, Lars. Yeah, and we look, we look really forward to a lecture later Great. today. All right, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. I was an assistant winemaker for three years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have to talk. Yeah. <laughs> to um, doing radio astronomy uh, within a year of time. I, I went from one extreme to the next. And um, I always had a passion for astronomy and space, so getting to use telescopes, massive telescopes all over the world, was really exciting. It led to all kinds of questions for me which then led me into doing more laboratory studies and trying to make chemistry that happens in space here on Earth. And um, NASA saw that as a, an extremely unique asset, and they, they actually sought me out 